Hi everyone, I'm Rachel. I Today I'm going to talk about an incredibly powerful procedural generation technique based on formal grammars. If you're not familiar with grammars, don't worry. Um, we're going to talk about a specific type of grammar today, shape grammars, a technique used for creating virtual buildings, procedurally generated cities and buildings. I originally created this talk as a part of a class that I gave at the University of Pennsylvania in procedural graphics techniques. And I really like this topic because grammars are incredibly flexible and applicable in a variety of different projects. So I hope you have fun hearing about not just procedural buildings, but also see the value in this technique in many other contexts. All right, so first off, why, why do we care about urban environments? Well, I hope that much is obvious, but in film and game industries, the bottleneck is always art asset creation. Artist time is expensive. And there's high demand for city and building assets because that's, of course, where a lot of, where a lot of worlds are set. However, um, buildings and buildings and uh, city environments are very detailed. Fortunately for us, they also have a lot of repetition. Across different buildings in a single neighborhood, you'll see a lot of repeated geometry, buildings with the same footprints. In a single building, you'll see repeated structural elements, windows, doors, columns, pillars, decorative elements, of course, ledges, um, court, or the same decorative element placed on corners of things, and textures and materials. And if we're thinking like procedural artists, repetition, of course, means that it's something that we can definitely generate. So urban environments are a good sandbox for thinking about procedural generation. Now, with just a bit of code, we can create, of course, the fun of proceduralism is we can create infinite cities, living architecture, and if we have a good generator, we can easily swap out whatever our base assets are in order to create more fantasy environments, more realistic environments. We got the power if we can come up with a good generator. I don't, I'm not going to... Uh, delve into all of these demos, but trust me when I say that there's a lot. Uh, one of my favorite examples from recent years um, was um, Big Hero 6. If you haven't seen it, there's a very memorable scene in which Hero and Baymax fly over a huge sprawling city, which would have taken an unthinkable amount of time to generate, to create manually. There's just no way all of these buildings could have, be created, could have been created one by one. They were, of course, procedurally generated. All right, back to business. So, um, what is so? Let's talk conceptually first. What is the problem of generating buildings? Well, um, if you've worked with L systems, this is going to sound very similar, but. When we're thinking about procedural problems in general, um, generating complexity is basically just like programming. In that what we're doing is essentially just finding the basic building blocks of whatever we're, <laughs> building blocks, building blocks of whatever structure we're trying to generate. And once we have whatever those atomic elements are, we're figuring out um, where, what, in what context they appear. What are the rules that govern where they should be? So for instance, if we're trying to generate a building like what we see on the right hand side over here, we might we might start by saying, let's let's figure out what the basic elements are, which might consist of just a few cubes at first or the set of things that you see on the left hand side over there. Next, we figure out what the contexts are. So I might say, all right, I can take a series of big cubes that are such and such size and say that they intersect like this. And I also am going to add these little window-like structures on the top by saying I have a different set of smaller cubes and they appear up at the top. So we've been talking pretty abstract so far, but um, uh, just to take a step back for a second, 
whenever we deal with any sort of procedural problem, what we're doing is, um, or I would divide the process into three different parts. One, we have to think of first a way of representing whatever the thing that we're trying to generate is pro programmatically. So for example, I, I can assign a different symbol to every one of these shapes. Um, all of these basic unit blocks, I can just give a variable name like A, B, C, and D. And I can attach to that variable, I, I can attach to that symbol some, some amount of extra information like how big is it, where does it appear in the world, what color is it, etc. That kind of metadata. So that's step one in our procedural generation process is figure out how to represent the data that we're trying to manipulate. Step two is, of course, how do we actually generate stuff? So once we have a representation of like the components that we're working with, now we need to actually come up with an algorithm for, uh, for, manip for manipulating, combining, transforming, whatever the basic data that we're working with is. Next up, finally, the third step is taking whatever we've generated, so some complicated sequence of objects, say, tagged again with some sort of interesting metadata, and turn it into whatever actual output is. So taking a bunch of data objects, like building A at point zero zero in the world, and actually generating the geometry, in this case, that make it up. So. Let's, let's look um, at some examples for how a shape grammar rule would look. To that the basic rule for um, creating complicated structures is figuring out what is the smallest part, what are the, what are the component parts of your complicated object, and in what context do they appear. So for example, I might say, um, I want to generate some complicated structure using cubes, and um, I'm going to come up with a rule that says I can turn one single cube into two cubes of different sizes with some specific spatial relationship to each other. And it's amazing how complicated you can get using just a very simple set of shapes and a very simple set of rules. For instance, here we have a big block and a small block. Let's call them A and B. And for each of those blocks, we have a single rule that says, all right, I'm going to take an A, for the big block and turn it into an A and a B that are positioned in this way. Say, and I have a second rule for B that gives me also a B and an A positioned again in a specific way. And just given these two, these two rules on these two shapes, if we apply them at, in different orders, um, such as, as you can see in the sequences below, we can actually get some complexity really quickly just with a few iterations of these rules. Again, all we're doing is saying, all right, take, take an input shape, apply some rule to it, and then take the output and apply another rule to it by at each stage selecting one shape and applying the rule, or selecting one shape in our set and applying whatever rule we can to it. So for instance, in this top row, we operate first on the big block, then on the, bi then on the big block again, but in a different orientation. And then here on the small block, et cetera, et cetera. So the interesting thing about this whole, about this production process that I've just described is um, it's the, production process and the rendering instructions are a little more intertwined than in some than in something like say a classic L system. So remember I was talking about um, the procedural generation process has three steps. Stage two is gener actually generate your data and stage three is interpret that data. Well the in, when we're working with shapes like this, we have to include in our object like the data that we use to render the object, right? So if we're working on geometry, it'll be things like what's the transformation of this particular cube. So in our production process, that's, that spatial information, if we have a rule like the ones we were just looking at, has to be included in our production process. For instance, with this shape rule over here, 
we have, let's say we start off operating on some big cube, some, some cube that's positioned at the origin of our world, zero, zero, zero. This second block over here might now be positioned at, uh, at point one, 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 but it's not, or it's not a hard coded relationship. It's relative to whatever the input cube would be. So it's some X, Y, Z position plus one, plus one, plus one in order to get the position of our new thing. And that's the key with working with shape grammars is figuring out, uh, or is the observation that whenever we apply a rule, we're actually taking some data from uh, whatever our input was and using that data in order to generate um, whatever the next step is, the output of our rule. Okay, now that we've talked about things on a conceptual level, let's actually look at formalizing what we've just talked about. So when we work on shape grammars, um, the uh, basic data unit is, let's call it, let's call it a shape. Makes sense, right? It's going to consist of a couple of different things. First off is a symbol, which is what is the representation of the object that, or what, what type of object am I representing? So for example, in this case, I said big block and little block, we can just call them A or B. And those will represent different types. Next, um, we have geometry. Geometry just says what is the out what is the like output geometry type of the thing that I'm going to be operating on. In this example here, um, both of the sh input shapes A and B are both cubes, but it didn't have to be. I could have made B a sphere or a tetrahedron or any other number of things. Um, finally, we have some numeric attributes. Th these are things like what is the transformation of the object in my in the world, etc. Um, uh, translation scale. You could even add some things like color or um, what kind of texture you're using. All sorts of things. Finally, also symbols. Um, like the A and B I was referring to, can also have um, additional information, which is, is it a terminal or non-terminal shape? And this is just going to tell us whether or not we can, there are any rules that can be applied to it, or whether it should just stop. Um, why is this important? Well, I might have some unit that I don't want to, uh, that I don't want to add any more complexity onto. Okay. Now, those are the shapes. Next, let's define our rules. A rule is something that is basically just a function that says, I have, I take some input, I give you some output. And um, just by convention, we call the inputs and outputs in our, um, in, our, uh, in our rules predecessors and successors. So in this case, um, the big block in shape rule one would be the predecessor, and this these two output shapes would be the successor. Now, how we get from uh, from predecessor to successor in shape grammars is we apply some function to the predecessor. In this case, or in this case, shape rule one, it's going to take the function is going to take the numeric attributes of our input and use them to compute the uh, the positioning of uh, the second shape and just copy the first one. Finally, um, we can also attach a probability to a rule. Um, and the reason why we need a probability is to add variation into our system. So there's already a little bit of variation in this system because uh, we switched up which rules we we're using at each iteration. But there is exactly one rule that applies to each input shape. We could have had, however, like ten different rules that take a uh, that take a big box and just do and add something different on. In that case, we could just attach a probability to each of those rules, so there's some randomness in our system, which very quickly gives us some more organic looking behavior. All right. So to formalize the production process, the algorithm, the stage two of our procedural technique, what we do is we start with some initial configuration of, of shapes. So some input, we could start with say a single cube in that example we're looking at. Next, we pick one of the shapes from our set. Now, 
um, let's call that shape S. Next, choose some rule in our collection of rules, of all possible rules, that takes S as a predecessor and compute the successors. Uh, successor or successors can be multiple shapes, right? Take, and let's call that S new, add that to the set. Then delete the original parent from the set. And we just repeat all until all of the shapes in our set are terminal, meaning there are no shapes left that can add any more, uh, that can be replaced via any of our production rules. However, um, we could also just run for n number of iterations rather than waiting until we're out of shapes that have uh, valid operations on them. There's a lot of flexibility here. This is just a template. So let's look at what an example looks Let's look at an example of uh, using numeric attributes. Here's uh, what a here's a building facade as an example. I might say, all right, I can take a building front and split it into uh, some floors and a ledge, and I might have a rule that now takes one of these abstract floor units and turns it into um, a series of window units, window wall units. Um, a floor can become a sequence of B, A, A, B. Now, um, these are just abstract things until we also give them numeric attributes, right? We need to know how big the windows are if we, or if we have floors of specific size. So in this case, the rules takes the height and width of the floor and, uh, and gives in return four different like wall tiles that have the correct, uh, that have the correct size. So floors of height three, all your windows have to be a foot of height three. The row of four windows together have to add up to the total, uh, the total size of the floor, et cetera. All right, let's look at this. Um, let's look at some basic rules in the context of a larger simple system. So I have, let's say I'm trying to generate a simple temple like this. I could say, all right, I'm gonna start with some abstract symbol that represents my whole temple. And I'll create a rule that says my temple is actually consists of three parts. There's a roof, there is a series of columns in the middle, and then there's a podium at the bottom. Now I can take this like big grouping of columns and say, all right, what's the, what, what are the columns? Well, they're individual columns repeated some number of times. All right, what's an individual column? An individual column consists of a capital at the top, a shaft in the middle, and a base at the bottom. And again, by taking this, uh, a complicated structure, not even that complicated in this case, and splitting it into component parts, I can quickly define a set of rules that describes the building. All right. Now, all of these shape rules are all very good and well, but there are a bunch of hairy issues that we also have to keep in mind. It's not as simple as just, um, just mashing a bunch of rules together. For one, let's say I have, a, I have a simple building with a footprint that's a square, and I want to add a tower onto it. One issue that could crop up is um, what's depicted below, which is I could create uh, two intersecting turrets if I just apply if I'm just applying laws willy nilly, and that's no good. There are a couple of different approaches that you could take in order to avoid those intersection problems. So what we've been talking about so far is using an additive approach, saying, all right, we have some piece of input geometry. I'm going to uh, replace it with a different with a different thing or replace it with several other things and keep adding on. However, this is what creates intersection problems. In order to not do that, we might have to use a, or we would have to use a spatial data structure like an octree or a quad tree in order to keep track of what space is already occupied. So when I try and apply a rule, I can basically have a conditional check that says, well, I'd like to add this building piece here, but don't add it if there's already something there based on, um, based on the data in my uh, spatial data structure. However, coding an octree can be a lot of work. So another kind of hack, which I'm fond of, is using a subtractive approach, which means rather than adding geometry on, we just shrink the geometry that we already have. For instance, we could start with a big square and say, I'm gonna make a production rule which takes this big square, um, 
divides it into two pieces or two smaller squares and then we'll take um, either one of the squares and shrink it a bit. And this gives us essentially the same behavior. Another nice thing about um, shape grammars or grammars in general or something to think or in this in general this is a good procedural observation is that we can use external data by just applying things conditionally based on say a texture for example let's say i have a noise texture like uh like this cloudy looking thing at the bottom in um, while i'm computing the successors in um, in my grammar production process I can say, well, ordinary. Let's say uh, I'm going to drop a bunch of a, a bunch of points that can become buildings of type A. Um, I'm computing the numeric attributes based on something, right? I'm just programming. So I can also read from a noise texture and say, all right, if I was gonna put my uh, my my square at points like zero zero, I can look at my noise texture at that position and say, read me the value there. Based on what the value is, um, and we can interpret this value as whatever we want, let's say like population density, uh, alter the size of my building. And what we'll, this will automatically give us is some interesting variation. So the, the picture that I have at the bottom here isn't particularly interesting, but if you can imagine if you were, can imagine placing like tons and tons and tons of very dense buildings, very quickly you could see some more interesting looking organic patterns. So there's always opportunities to read from external data. Another issue with that's specific to um, generating urban environments is, however, that in um, cities, buildings look have to look designed in order to be believable. Unlike generating something like a tree, there's a sense of design, there's a sense of order. So if you, even if you create a good rule set, if you just apply all of the rules willy-nilly, you're going to get some pretty chaotic looking behavior that might not look like a building. And hey, maybe that's what you're going for. But if you're not, if you want to go for a more realistic look, you got to think about how to mimic that human design process. Um, by adding in symmetry, guidelines, thinking carefully about what your rule set is going to do and in what order rules can be applied. So another cool idea that the creators of City Engine, a popular, um, a popular commercial procedural city tool, um, came up with was that they observed this chaos issue and um, created a notion of snap lines. Basically, whenever you create a building, create certain lines of symmetry, certain line organizational lines. And uh, whenever you do, like, say, a subdivide or some, some operation that cuts a conceptual block into smaller parts, you can, if a, any of the borders fall close to one of those snap lines, you can just scoot it over, snapping it to that line in order to artificially create um, more organized looking lines of symmetry, things like that. So this is this is an, a neat idea for uh, for uh, for creating that design look. All right, based on just what we've talked about, um, I wanted to show you a example of these principles in action. So I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with Houdini. Houdini is a 3D modeling tool built for procedural generation. Highly recommend you check it out if you haven't. There's a free student edition. Anyways, Houdini, Houdini also allows you to do things like attach Python scripts in your um, asset generation process. So with one of my good friends, Austin, I wrote a procedural castle generator using just the principles that we've been discussing. So. Here's, here's my castle in Houdini. And I want to show you how it was generated. So I basically wrote a uh, grammar parser that just applies a series of rules. I think I only have a couple of rules. Um, I think it's only four different rules. And um, I just apply it for n number of generations, which I can specify. So let's see what this looks like at the very beginning. Very beginning, I start off with something. Actually, sorry, very beginning would be generation zero. I start off with something not particularly interesting. It's just a big square. And however, I'm using a subtractive technique, which uh, 
recursively subdivides this starting shape into more and more complicated structures. The roof looks really derpy here because it's just scaled based on the footprint and we stood out real big. Ah. All right, so let's see what this looks like as we subdivide. We bump this up into generation three. All right, so what this has done is now it's cut that original square into two squares and shrunk one of them, transformed it a little bit. And another rule added this little turret, which isn't scaled because I'm lazy. All right, now let's look at a further generation and we can see that those child keeps have been further subdivided into more and more buildings. Jumping ahead yet again. And you can see my rules are pretty simple, but if you, can, if you apply them for enough generations, very quickly you get all sorts of emergent complexity. And all I'm doing is manipulating um, pretty simple units. I'm no artist, but I went in and I modeled a couple of different tileable assets. I have a wall unit, I have a wall unit with windows, I have these crenellations, and I have this single roof type that just scales based on whatever building it's sitting on top of. And using rules similar to that, that example I showed you of taking a floor and cutting it into wall units, and I think I have like a random 50-50 a, a random um, application of either window or no window, you very quickly get this emergent complexity. Remember seed number 69 being good too. Houdini is going to think for a second. So this is pretty neat. I have infinite castles now. I have one additional uh, rule that works along the y-axis, which is I can take a tall building of a certain height and cut it into two pieces and take the top tower and scale it down a little bit, as you can see over here. All right, so that's an example of a procedural, of a grammar-based procedural building system in action. This is an incredibly powerful technique. It wasn't all that hard to write if you are if you are a competent programmer, it's a really like fun and easy exercise that you can use in a variety of different contexts. So I showed you just one application, procedural building generation. But let's say you wanted to make a um, a procedural solar system. You could say, well, the solar system consists of a star and orbited by a series of planets. Um, a series of planets consists of um, a, a set of planet groupings. And a planet groupings, and a planet grouping uh, consists of one main planet surrounded by some number of moons. And you can adjust the distance between all of these different things um, as you compute uh, successors in your rule application. And that's just another example. There's so, so many different things you can do with uh, formal grammars. I really hope that you have that you will take this idea and go and build wonderful things with it. All right, so this was a short sample of um, some content from my class. If you're interested in learning more about grammars or in general, learning about procedural graphics techniques, check out, um, check out my materials. Everything is open source and I have a series of uh, coding projects with some starter code that will get you more well versed with a ser with um, some basic techniques. So thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this. Go off and build cool stuff that makes other stuff. Bye now. <laughs>